Okay, we're going to uh, we're going to get started again. Again, this is uh, Gerard from Netzel, and this is uh, Kubernetes best practices from KubeCon. <clears throat> so, if you don't know what KubeCon is, uh, don't worry. Uh, we're going to give you kind of a, a brief overview. Also, KubeCon was a convention all about Kubernetes, and uh, there's been a huge transition towards Kubernetes right now. But if you're unfamiliar, we're going to kind of briefly uh, give an overview of um, why there's why Kubernetes is so important and why so many companies are transitioning this way. Then if you are running Kubernetes in production, uh, then I'm sure you're aware of some of these new uh, monitoring challenges associated with them. And then we're going to go into the best practices from KubeCon. Um, hint, uh, it has to do with uh, service level monitoring. And then we're going to finish it up with some Q&A. And uh, real quickly, monitoring is obviously a, a very broad topic. Um, this webinar is going to focus specifically on applications and services running in your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, we'll have additional webinars to uh, go over databases, message queues, and some additional technologies. So uh, KubeCon was an awesome event uh, last month. It was in Austin, Texas, uh, December 5th through the 8th. Uh, there was over 4,000 attendees, which is by far the largest KubeCon, um, 100 sessions, and uh, a big focus on uh, community and learning. Um, you know, if we had uh, one complaint uh, for the event, it would have been the weather. You know, it, uh, it snows in uh, Texas about once every six years, and uh, it happened to snow twice <laughs> during KubeCon. Um, but uh, we still had a lot of fun. And, uh, and made it through. So, you know, why is uh, Kubernetes uh, so um, important? Why are so many uh, people interested in it? So I did engineering undergrad, and if I had to sum that into one sentence, it's all about uh, taking big problems and breaking them down into small, simpler problems. And containers is a perfect application for this. Uh, a container is, is much more portable, as a developer, I can work on it on my laptop, and then that can be moved to a data center or a public or private cloud. I can also scale containers individually and update them individually. And if you're using an orchestrator like Kubernetes, uh, you get additional benefits like self-healing, uh, higher utilization of your instances, uh, which means um, more money saved, and also uh, service discovery and load balancing. So if you're running Kubernetes in production, uh, you're probably aware of some of these issues. Uh, one of them being uh, cascading failures. So your containers are now talking to one or more additional containers. And this is leading to uh, many interdependencies in your application, as well as uh, a changing architect. Uh, so this means that if you have a container that starts throwing errors, the issue could be with that container, or it could be with any other container down the dependency chain. So this means that when you're troubleshooting an issue, uh, it can feel like it's turning into a murder mystery, uh, trying to figure out who done it. Uh, another issue that you've probably experienced running Kubernetes in production is the plethora of new and noisy metrics. Uh, new metrics because now every container has its own unique set of metrics. And noisy uh, because these containers are now ephemeral. Uh, they only last for a short period of time. And this can lead to some false positives. So for example, if uh, you're alerting on uh, CPU, you could very easily have the scenario where uh, you receive an alert that a container has violated a CPU threshold. Uh, but by the time you go to investigate that issue, uh, Kubernetes has already killed it off and uh, spun it up on a new host, uh, no longer having a problem. So, these characteristics of containers are bringing about a new methodology switch. That is from teaching or treating infrastructure like pets uh, that you care for to treating it like cattle. 
uh, <clears throat> indispensable. So containers we name with, uh, with a string of numbers uh, because they're almost identical and as we mentioned, uh, ephemeral. So this means that when a container is, is sick or have an issue, uh, we're perfectly fine with just grabbing a new one. Now, uh, if, you were if you still want a pet, uh, there's hope uh, because there is a new pet and that is the Kubernetes service. A Kubernetes service is defined as one or more identical pods. And rather than giving it a random string of numbers, uh, we give them specific names, usually using the deployment variable uh, kubeapp or kubename, uh, but you can use any deployer, <coughs> deployment variable you want. And essentially, uh, we're bringing things up uh, an abstraction layer. So we're taking all of the noisy container metrics and we're adding context uh, to that metrics by defining it as a service. And unlike containers, you don't want your services to be ephemeral. You know, you don't want them uh, coming up and, and coming down as, as they want. You want them to be persistent and, and always there. So if you do see a health issue with a service, you're going to want to investigate it and you're gonna want to nurse uh, that service back to health. So real quick, I went over some uh, terminologies in uh, Kubernetes and just wanted to, if, uh, if anyone's new to it, just want to kind of briefly over, go over some of those terminologies. So uh, we have the concept of a, of a namespace in Kubernetes and, and inside of that namespace, you'll have one or more services. Uh, so these are your new pets. And then a service is made up of one or more identical pods. And then a pod, is made up of several containers. Uh, you'll, you'll have your uh, container that's running your application code. Uh, you'll also have maybe a utility container from Kubernetes, and then you'll maybe have other containers um, like sidecars or uh, certificate containers. So these will be your cattle. So now that we know our services are our new pets and we need to keep them healthy, how do we, how do we know if a service is healthy or not? The answer is this, is to uh, look at the SLOs, the service level objectives. And these are uh, latency, throughput, and error rate. If you're familiar with the Google Golden Signals or the Google SRE Handbook, uh, they refer to these as the Golden Signals. And by knowing as soon as a service violates an SLO, you can greatly reduce uh, cascading failures. That is letting that uh, service to persist with issues, causing issues later um, and further down the dependency chain. But it's a little more complicated than that. And that's because as we talked about before, uh, containers are talking to uh, several other containers all at once. Uh, for example, uh, this service right here called Frontend is talking to one, two, three, four other services. So that means if you have a, a spike uh, with a, or an issue with one of the services that Frontend is interacting with, uh, this can uh, easily get lost in the aggregate. And then that's your whole issue again. So what's really important uh, to understand, and this is one of the best practices out of KubeCon, is that you have to know uh, the per service, per route metrics. You need to know uh, the latency and error rate on each individual service interaction so that you can know as soon as an SLO uh, starts to get violated. So in summary, uh, you'll need to collect data at the container or pod level, but you're going to want to alert at the service level because they have given context to those container metrics. And uh, the two um, kind of basic ones, the most important ones that was talked about at KubeCon was being able to know error rate and also latency uh, per service per route. 
Now, we briefly went over some other metrics at KubeCon that are also really important. And one that really stood out uh, is this utilization. Uh, utilization is the amount of resources a pod or container is using uh, compared to what is actually been allocated. <clears throat> so in a way, you can think of utiliz utilization as giving context to CPU and RAM. So you just don't have a random CPU or RAM uh, data point you have it in relationship to uh, the limits that you've set for that pod or container. And speaking of limits, that's another best practices from, from Kubernetes. Uh, they recommend that every pod in every container have a limit. And by looking at utilization, you can easily er uh, verify that this has happened. Now, <clears throat> I'm sure we can think of looking at things that are using high utilization, uh, but we. At KubeCon, they also mentioned that looking at things with low utilization is also very important. And one of these reasons is because the whole concept of Kubernetes is about optimizing your infrastructure, uh, getting much higher uh, utilization per instance, which can save you money. So finding pods and containers which are using only half or a quarter of the resources they've been allocated uh, can help you increase your utilization per instance. So just to summarize uh, the best practices from KubeCon. Um, so as we talked about, these are kind of a starting point. Uh, these are the, the minimum metrics that you need to be looking at. You know, for your particular environment, you might find that there's additional alerts uh, that you want to add and you want to be aware of, but this is kind of a, a great starting point for anyone running Kubernetes. And that is to be able to alert on uh, going outside of latency, an error rate threshold per service, per route. Uh, very important to understand the per service, per route metrics. You know, as we talked about with the, the noisy metrics, uh, Kubernetes can restart pods for you uh, that are having issues. Uh, but if you notice that a pod is restarting, you know, many times in a short amount of time, uh, there's probably an underlying issue that you want to investigate. So it was also best practice to alert on you know high levels of, of pod restarts, you know restarting many times within the course of a minute or or a five minute period. And then uh, infrastructure metrics are, are still important. Utilization uh, was one of the most important ones that they talked about. You might not want to alert on this capability, but you definitely want to monitor it and be aware of it. So knowing uh, both your high utilization as well as your your low utilization pods and containers. So we had the opportunity to uh, be right there in Austin, Texas for KubeCon, uh, but if you didn't, uh, the great thing is uh, almost all of the sessions are on YouTube. So if you just Google uh, Kubernetes uh, Austin, Texas YouTube, uh, you're likely to find them. Uh, these were some of my favorite ones uh, pertaining to uh, monitoring. So if you want to maybe dive a little deeper into some of the topics uh, I talked about, uh, these would be a great uh, first step. And at this point, you know, as I said, we let, we're going to leave a lot of uh, time for questions. Uh, so we're going to answer, uh, we're going to open this for questions. Our uh, head of product, Arvin, um, is going to help me uh, bring some of these questions up and uh, also if, uh, if, if they become a little too technical as well. Arvind, do we have any uh, uh, questions to start with? Uh, doesn't look doesn't look like we have any in the Q and A window, but we uh, come across some of the common ones, um, or these were like also hotly discussed. Uh, one is around Envoy um, and the use of Envoy for um, observing. So if you guys are familiar with Envoy or thinking of using it. Uh, it's it's a great um, sort of lightweight proxy uh, which you can put in um, as a sidecar. Um, but the challenge right now um, is twofold. One, um, it's still maturing, um, and two, um, you uh, you are essentially left with managing a lot of proxies uh, because there are uh, if you if you have one proxy per pod. If you have hundreds of pods or thousands of pods, that means you have that many uh, proxies, right? 
Um, but the challenge, underlying challenge is that you need uh, to route the traffic, uh, you need more sort of better options than what Kubelet uh, provides right now uh, in terms of uh, load balancing the traffic. Uh, so it has a lot of value, but uh, it comes with its own set of headaches. And as I said, it's still maturing rapidly. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, from a monitoring perspective, Envoy is interesting um, because it will give you the same sort of uh, service interaction insights, latency, throughput. Um, uh, without requiring you to do any deeper analysis, right? So it's just like you're tapping into HA proxy uh, to get this, uh, those metrics. Um, from NetSill perspective, we are gonna integrate with uh, Envoy uh, as we see more demand for it. Um, another common uh, monitoring tool that we came across, um, which probably everyone is familiar is uh, on Prometheus, uh, which is, um, open source and, uh, and and right now it's a single instance so you, you doesn't have a scale out architecture uh, but Prometheus is great if you're doing custom metrics uh, and NetSill is also going to ingest the Prometheus format metrics uh, that's in the works already so those were some of the common things Envoy and Prometheus and looks like we have a couple of questions so the first one is do I need NetSill and Datadog um, so NetSill has uh, all the same integrations at, as Datadog. In fact, we both the companies use the same open source um, agents. So it, it is, you don't necessarily need it. We have the same CLIs, APIs, SDK, same integrations. Um, so you don't need, with NetSill, you definitely get much more, which is we can automatically analyze your service interaction, generate the map, give you insights into latency and HTTP errors and things like that, right? Like 400, 500 errors. Uh, so definitely much more um, broader coverage. Um, you don't necessarily need Datadog if you're using uh, NetSell. Um, then there is another question which is around K8 services as the new pets and monitoring those. How does this change if you are uh, using service discovery provided by tools like Console or Eureka? Uh, it doesn't necessarily change much. Uh, usually Console and Eureka, are those kind of tools you would use for uh, sort of previous generation of workloads where there is no service discovery. Um, in the Kubernetes case, the Kubernetes itself provides you service discovery, so it will, um, you know, you don't need additional ones. But if you are using console, Eureka, and things like that, we can marry the metadata from console and give you uh, that view as well. So it's very complementary. Um, it's just a way of defining the service, whether you put it in console or Kubernetes tells you using uh, tags and labels. How does NetSell monitor cascading failures? So monitoring, monitoring cascading failures is like there is a chain of services, right? A is talking to B, B is talking to C, C is talking to D. Um, one thing which we do is we automatically, uh, like if you create a simple query such as monitor all HTTP transactions grouped by client and server, we will monitor all of these uh, services, whether A is talking to B, B is talking to C and so on and so forth. And if there is error in any, any one part of the chain, we will notify you and then using the map, you can see those dependencies um, and, and then analyze it. So it's pretty easy. You don't have to do net stat or you don't have to go look at TCP dump or Wireshark and things like that. It's all live and available. Uh, who's talking to who? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I can actually show uh, on the product uh, really quick as well. Um, so, so this is inside of the, uh, the, the NetSell tool. And um, if we go to the, the map view, uh, this is the map of, of all of your pods. Uh, so you can see that NetSell is collecting all of the data um, at, the, at the pod level. And uh, if I jump into uh, one of the pods, um, I can see the, the instances that make it up. So I can see in here that there's one pod and two containers. And then inside of this container, I can see the deployment variables uh, like a uh, kube name uh, that we've assigned. Um, this, so this is your new uh, pet, uh, the Kubernetes service. So then inside of the dashboards, we can use uh, that, that variable 
Uh, so essentially, if you see this, um, this query, uh, we're looking at the, the client server pairs um, as defined by kube name. So we can see the latency uh, between uh, these two services as, as broken out in, in the graph. So uh, I did in the example, I used uh, kube um, the, the front end uh, as showing that it's, it's, it's uh, interacting with, with several services. So uh, here I can see, so this would be the, this would be the uh, latency of front end as a whole. So if I was just looking at the front end as a whole, and here I can see it broken down uh, per service per route. So you can see you get much more granularity and any sort of spike um, on this side can get lost uh, in the aggregate over here. And then um, as, as Arvin mentioned, you know, you can set uh, thresholds for each of your services to set SLOs. But if you're running uh, lots of services and need an easier way, uh, you can also do things like uh, delta, uh, mapping deltas to see if there has been a significant spike uh, one way or the other. So in this one, we're going to look at the uh, latency for a client server pair as before. But then we're also going to pull in another metric uh, where we look at uh, a five minute delta of the data. The data uh, shifted by five minutes. And then uh, we're going to evaluate that. So kind of A, the latency now minus uh, B, the latency five minutes ago, uh, normalize it and uh, times it by 100 to get a percentage. So you could set an alert off of uh, a percentage latency chain. So you want to be alerted anytime the latency goes up by 20%, for example. Another question we have is how do you, how does Netsil build map uh, using Kates API or something internal? So we do use Kates API to pull in metadata, like all the all of your tags, pod names, namespaces, and all those details. Uh, but in order to establish dependency between the pods, uh, what we do is we uh, we take a copy of your packet and we reconstruct. We do a deep analysis of those packets, um, and that generates the live uh, live dependency map. So we get the metadata from Kubernetes, but the dependency we are getting by analyzing uh, the service interactions. Cool, those are some really great questions. Hello anyway, guys, uh, whoever attended, uh, you guys can easily try NetSil. Uh, all you need to do is uh, just sign up and install the collectors. Installing the collectors is also pretty easy. You just have to run one kubectl co command and install the collectors as daemon set. So it's like five minutes and you will get uh, uh, the, the maps and everything going. Someone asked something like DPI. I'm, not sure I'm familiar with what DPI stands for. So I might need some more information there. What is the performance impact of NetSill agents? The performance impact is dependent on, uh, on mainly on amount of throughput that is going uh, into the applications. For most of the microservices applications, the um, uh, throughput is like from 75 to you know, 250 RPS, that's what we have seen in the range. And for that, like about 5% CPU overhead is what we see on average, like five, 6%. Um, in, uh, deep packet inspection, yeah, so yes. So yes, uh, exactly, that's what we do. We, we take the L3, L4 packets, we dynamically reconstruct um, uh, the, those packets and get insights into the L7 protocol. So if you have HTTP communication going on, we take that and we reconstruct it into L7 uh, based on the L3, L4 packets. So you get deep insights uh, without having to worry about instrumenting anything. So yes, it is the packet inspection. Awesome, yeah, as uh, Arvin mentioned, if you want to uh, try Netsil out uh, yourself, uh, it's really simple to set up uh, from the website. Uh, you can just do uh, get starting free, uh, create your account, and then uh, via our YAML file, 
Uh, you essentially just create a namespace for Netsil and then run the YAML file to deploy all the collectors, as a daemon said. The Netsil maps, do they cover the container level as well or is, does it stop at the pod level? So in Kubernetes, the containers don't have any IP and the containers are not necessarily communicating to other containers, right? The IPs are assigned at the pod level and then the containers are doing essentially port mapping inside of it. So we do see the containers uh, and we can show you that this pod is made up of these containers. But if you plot a map of containers, uh, you won't see any edges because the IPs are all associated to the pod. So the container and all the information about their performance, CPU, uh, network traffic, and all those things are there. Just that the IP is not associated to container. So the map is, is better visualized at the pod level. What platforms does Netsil run on? Um, we can run on pretty much any platform, Kubernetes, non-Kubernetes. We support all sorts of uh, operating systems. So it should be fine. Uh, you can. You can try it out. The whole list of operating systems is, is listed there uh, to install the collectors. Um, but as far as I know, there isn't much of a restriction other than the later versions of any OS is fine. Yeah, so someone asked to see useful information, I do need to apply labels. Well, in general, in Kubernetes, uh, the, the philosophy is that you are going to create um, multiple redundant pods and these pods will collectively uh, render a service, right? They're, they're a part of a service. So yeah, using labels and tags are the way uh, Kubernetes operates and that's how you would do it. Uh, and that's how most of the people identify their service that, hey, that's a, uh, a uh, web server that is a Redis cluster that is at CD and they just add labels and identify them. Someone asked whether the slides will be available. Yes, the slides will be available. Um, so you can definitely download and check it out later. Yeah, and to piggyback on the, um, on the labeling, um, it definitely is a best practice to uh, use deployment labels and um, you know, you can uh, update those and change them at, at, at any point too. So it's good to, to start with some labeling, uh, but if you come up with a, a different nomenclature or, or setup, uh, you can change those at, at, at any time too. There's a question, how does alerting work? Uh, alerting is similar to, um, you know, um, pretty much any other, like there isn't much of a, uh, difference other than the fact that you can alert on latency and throughput and errors. Uh, right now you can provide either uh, static thresholds, like you can say if the latency goes about uh, above 1000 milliseconds or 10,000 milliseconds, uh, or you can use uh, some, some more math, math, maths like uh, Gerard was showing, you can compare latency day over day or hour over hour uh, and do the alerting on those as well. Uh, yeah, Netsil can use any labels that you already have. We uh, call the cube, cube APIs to get all those labels and marry it to the pod data. So you don't need to do anything extra. Exactly, uh, from, uh, even from a dashboard, you can uh, add an alert by setting kind of like a, a, a threshold um, above which you want to be alerted on. Yeah. Does Netsil support proactive alert uh, machine learning, et cetera. Right now we don't do machine learning, but in our experience, simple things like rolling aggregate or, uh, you know, you can help you smooth out the variance um, and help you set a better alert. Um, just doing machine learning, sometimes it gives you good answers. Sometimes it gives you bad answers, right? There's like false positives and false negatives. Um, because ultimately machine learning and all those, they are dependent on how much data uh, gets ingested. So then during the initial stages of training, those kind of algorithms start creating a lot of noise and a lot of people then turn it off. Um, so it, it, it's a mixed bag, right? That nobody has, uh, you know, cracked that nut very reliably to give you that, hey, machines can actually reliably monitor and give you good set of alerts rather than spamming you with alerts. But we have algorithms that uh, we can do it. We just haven't enabled it yet. Uh, so short answer is it's something which we are looking at and evolving uh, if it becomes more and more useful. 
is there a trial option? Can I try before buying? Oh yeah, definitely you can uh, try. There is a 15 day, day free trial. You can go sign up for the SaaS uh, service, download the collectors easily, and definitely you can try it before buying. Yeah, start uh, start free trial uh, right from the website, as Arvin mentioned. Awesome. So those were uh, some some really great questions. Uh, we've gone about uh, uh, two minutes over, but um, definitely uh, worth it for questions. Any any more questions on on your end, Arvin? Nope, I'm good. Thanks everyone for joining. Okay, awesome. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Um, and the recording and uh, uh, and slides will be available. Awesome. Have a have a great day. Take care now.